<laughs> yeah, it is the first time, ladies and gentlemen. Hello and welcome to the talk show called Influencers. I am Good Guy Boris, your guest. No, I am your host, who is almost not drunk. And we are welcoming you for the first edition of the Influencer Show. Uh, I would like to do a small introduction first. I would like to say that my first guest is she and I'm very happy in my life to know her, to meet her personally, to work with her and uh, she has been an inspiration for me for a long time from the first time that I see actually I saw her work before I know her so our relationship was more professional than a friendship so professional escalated into a friendship and we had also the uh, big pleasure to be together to travel to meet and uh, it's somebody that I find very important in the scene of graffiti somebody who as far as I know and I believe doesn't write graffiti but do a lot for the scene documenting and presenting and pushing the levels to uh, completely new levels of project after project so without any further ado this is so, so, such a nice saying ladies and gentlemen I present you <laughs> ladies and gentlemen <laughs> ladies and gentlemen <laughs> Selena Mayer! <laughs> yeah! Oh, okay, should I take this off now? Now I have to see you at some point. <laughs> Hello! <laughs> Hi! Boris Belyovsky! <laughs> How are you, Selena Mayer? That was the best intro ever. I'm <laughs> How are you? That's okay, there's a bit of a time delay. Very well, thank you. Just, um, isolating with a glass of wine yes. in sydney australia it's um cheers about what is it 10 p.m here <laughs> what's your excuse <laughs> yeah How, where are you right now uh i'm in sydney australia okay um yeah at home would you like everybody else in the planet right now <laughs> yeah uh, most of the people would you tell me what are you doing the mm. how is corona time treating you um it's actually been really interesting for me because um, I've skipped two overseas trips so far because of the, the lockdown and I'm sort of realizing the benefit of staying home for extended periods of time. I moved into a new place, I've been spending time with friends and family and, and just um, also gotten a lot of work locally that I usually wouldn't have gotten because people assume that I'm overseas and so it's actually been quite good in that regard. and we're extremely lucky in Australia. We've only got a few, like 6,000 cases and we've got, I think we had, um, I'm going to get this totally wrong, but like less than 100 cases per day for the last few days. So yeah, definitely can't complain compared to what's going on in Europe and America and kind of everywhere else. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's been, it's been an interesting experience so far, but um, yeah, could be worse. That's for sure. Yeah. So, so I would like uh, I would like first to to start with a introduction from your side. Uh, tell me, how did you start it? We we gonna f we gonna speak first for videos because the first time I noticed you is because of your video work of things that you have posted or other people have posted, but uh, they have posted basically your work. And uh, I would like to know how Selena Mayo started her video Ooh. producing career. How? Tell me from the very beginning. Do you, do you, want, the, do you want the long version or the, the short version? Short, how long long we version. The short, long version. The short, long version? Okay. So, le, um, Graffiti and filmmaking have kind of been parallel in my whole career from the very beginning. The first video that I ever made was um, of Soffels, um, who's a graffiti writer from my hometown of Brisbane. And um, I hadn't studied it. I didn't want to be a filmmaker. I didn't really ever consider it. But I picked up this camera one day and made this video for him um, because he sort of just decided to... to 
make himself publicly known and sort of come out of anonymity after being anonymous for, for many years. And I, it was like, just like a light bulb moment the second that I sat down to edit this video. I just loved editing. It just absolutely clicked in my brain and I, I just knew that I'd found what I wanted to do because it was just so enjoyable. And um, yeah, and then ever since then, that's all I've done and that's now probably all I know how to do. Okay. <laughs> I'm not very good at much else, but um, yeah. But what? It's been about 10 years Tell now. Tell me what... What put the camera in your hands? How, how it happens? You knew him from before, if it's not a secret, like it's a, somebody, um, it's a friend. Yeah, there was a, so in Brisbane, Brisbane's like a city of maybe four million. It's, it's the third largest city in Brisbane, uh, in Australia, I think. Um, but it's quite a small place. And, and back then there was this one building in the center of the city and it was like an old industrial kind of art deco building. And some rich lady owned it and she'd given it to this group of artists and been like, we do, I just want it filled with art and, you know, you don't have to pay much rent. And so it was just filled with like graffiti writers living on the top floor and there was a photography studio and a record store and a lot of people had their start in their art careers in that building. Um, Soffles, um, um, a couple of other Australian, well-known Australian artists um, like Fintan McGee, um, Scotty Marsh, mm -hmm. They, they both lived there at one point. A lot of musicians as well, like Tom Thumb, Joel Birch used to be around the place, who's from a band called Amity Affliction. So we all kind of, it was like this little petri dish of creativity. And um, I had this tiny, tiny little office in that space. And so I was hanging out with and mixing with these people from like, quite a young age. Um, so that's why I did that video, because I was there, okay. you know, and we, you know, we were just all used to hang out. So, yeah. Yeah, but uh, Selena, further, this, this continue. It's like, okay, it, it, you had the opportunity, this, you took the camera, you did the video, but how this, how, how this continue mm -hmm. until today? Today you have okay, a so feature documentary made, so starting from just picking yeah. the camera, <laughs> just from picking the camera steps. randomly until, <laughs> until entering the, the biggest film industry, there is, uh, there is what is the rest of the story okay so um, from there so that, that was the first video I ever made and um, Soffles had this kind of sponsorship arrangement with Iron Lack which is a spray paint mm -hmm. company that's also from Brisbane another really lucky thing that, that they're like a local company so they put it on their YouTube mm -hmm. channel and this was back when you know like DSLRs were like a new thing and there weren't a lot of people editing videos, it's, it's completely different to the way it is today where every second person is a videographer and um, it was quite a, an unusual skill to have at that, at that mm -hmm. time. And um, so Iron like offered me a job. They're like, we've got all this other footage. Do you want to make some more videos for our channel? And I'd said yes, and you know, of course. And I think they paid me something like 200 bucks a video and a video would take me like two weeks of just slaving away in front of the computer. Um, but the cool thing about it was that there was like a pre-existing fan base and audience for these videos. Like 50,000 people might watch one of these yeah. videos, you know. From the very beginning of, of my career, I had an audience and people that were giving me feedback and I was really motivated to improve because I knew people were watching. And um, I'm super lucky that I got that job and and um, I just started making these these little clips for Iron Lack and. So I'd get footage on a hard drive from Mr. Wani in Milan or from uh, Bates in Copenhagen or from people in the US and, you know, like this 23-year-old girl in Australia sitting there in my pyjamas just, like, <laughs> watching all the raw material, you know? Like, have, like so, I, like, if I felt like these people were my friends before I ever met them because I got to watch all this stuff. It's mm -hmm. kind of creepy when you think about it. Um, and I did that for years and years and then um, I guess, like, the next big important moment was probably the Limitless video, which was about four four years into me making films. So that was a, a time-lapse video that uh, Soffles and I made together. Yeah, probably everybody have seen um, the video. It was just like a, yeah, and it was just like a personal project, um, but it got 12 million views on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And that was really the, the, the point that kicked it off um, for me as far as having a film career. So I got representation with commercial like agents in London and New York and uh, Paris. And then I started making commercials. So I was 25 at that point. And um, then, yeah, I've just been doing that ever since. And the commercials kind of pay the bills and, pay, and fi finance my personal projects. And 
Um, and I also do a lot of like street art festivals and I've kind of found myself in this little niche of, of art, art films. And um, yeah, so that's the short version. And then that kind of culminated in about two years ago, I did a big ad and I got a big paycheck from it and I decided to put the money into uh, making a video with Martha Cooper. Yes. And it was just meant to be like a 10 minute piece. And yeah, here we are two and a half years later and I made a feature film, which I was not expecting to do. That wasn't the plan, but that's what happened. So yeah, and now here we are. Great. So we will speak about this a bit later. Is that enough information? This is, uh, this is enough information. <laughs> so this uh, put a question. Okay. You say that the, the commercial job sponsored your hobby, kind of uh, hobby side projects. What, what, kind yeah. of, what kind of projects we are talking about? Can you name something or explain the, the concept of these uh, hobby projects? What, what was this that you wanted, that you used the money to, to put in, the things that was, you were passionate to do? Yeah, I think... I think this is true for a lot of um, freelance freelancers and creatives and artists um, that it's so often the the personal projects that you do as in the ones that you really want to make and that you're passionate about and that you care about that might not have a budget behind them or, or a client behind them. The one, They're the ones that end up in your portfolio and on your showreel and that's the work that gets seen. And then you get hired to make something kind of similar, but then you've got all these limitations of a brand and a client, so it doesn't end up on the reel, but it pays for the next one. So it's kind of this this cycle. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I've learned. So I think it's it's really important to always keep doing personal projects because um, they, they always just end up being the best, the best ones. And so the types of personal projects I've done um has been things like um the limitless video that was that wasn't commissioned by iron like that was something we just did um and then we gave it to them to put on their channel um my friend Guido van helton went to iceland for a project and he's like do you want to come and i went for four days and we made a a really cute little um portrait yeah. of him and like that got a vimeo staff pick which is not like a pretty it's a pretty good thing to to yeah. get as a as a filmmaker because a lot of people see it you so um this, uh, this feature. yeah i went to serbia and visited um sobek and cases sobexis yeah. um for 10 days and just like hung out in in belgrade and and filmed them painting and you know that was a personal project that was super fun um i made a video with um felipe pantone yeah. that um Uh, yeah, things like that. So none of those have been financed by anybody. They've just been things I wanted to do. And the other thing that's made that possible for me that other people might not, not have um, is that I can shoot, I shoot and edit a lot of my own films. I own a lot of my own equipment. So I, once I've got the gear, I don't really need much money to make it happen. So... Oh, and the time I came and visited yes. you. Yes, <laughs> this, this is a bit a big uh, <laughs> fast forward, 10 years more, more or less. In, that, that's a, but that was yeah. a personal this project was, as it's well. It's nice that this, is, this happened because yeah. we are, uh, most of the time we are on the opposite side of the world, which is not a big problem, but you travel a lot, mm -hmm. no? Uh, yeah, well, not not lately, yeah, but yeah, okay. Right now, is. nobody travels. So now yeah. we travel through the broadcast mm. and to the fiber uh, optical cables of the internet key and the satellite. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, this is how we travel. But uh, mm -hmm. in general, you your work is uh, is requires and also provides you a lot of travel, which is mm. I, I I suppose this is nice. So, uh, at what point did you did you label? Did you realize? And did you name, did you realize that you're a director, film director? Mm, that's a good question. Film director? I only kind of got comfortable with the idea of that being my job title after, after the, you know, the film I made about Martha. Um, but director, I guess, yeah, when I, when, I, when I started getting signed as a director, And the way that happened was so funny because most people, when they get signed by, like when they get a rep, like a, you know, like a commercial um, agent, they've sort of been in the industry for years and they've worked up to that job. I had no clue what I was doing. Like pretty much everything I'd done by myself, I'd never really been on a film set. And 
after the the Limitless video went so viral, um, the next thing I did was a Pepsi commercial, and I was 25. I'd been overseas twice ever with friends or you know yeah. traveling with friends, and I got put on this plane to London by myself. And I arrived there and there was just these people there and they were like, welcome to London. We'll see you at the office at 9 a.m. And I had to go into these like meetings with advertising agencies and production. And, and you know, I would have written this like awkward email that I thought was between me and the producer and they'd printed it out and given like 10 copies of it to everyone in the room, <laughs> including the client from Pepsi. And they'd, and they'd be like, so Selena, can you, can you tell us about uh, your, your concept here? And I'm just like... I'm like, I'm like up, I was so out of my depth. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, but I managed somehow, you know, I, I, I look back on that now and I wonder if those, if all those people I worked with realized how clueless I was. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I worked with some really kind people, like some crew, like especially directors of photography and, um, that were really supportive and, and like took me under their wing. And, and so, yeah. I had to learn pretty quickly, but it's the best way to learn, you know, just get thrown in the deep end and try and pretend like you know what you're talking about when you clearly don't act um, in a foreign country fit. at 25 yeah, years act old. Act as you fit there. <laughs> but okay, yeah. you you didn't have any experience, but just adapting and doing the best you, you managed. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that's that's the cool thing about working on a film set, like especially commercials, um, there's so many people that are all so good at their job that, you know, as a director, your role is just to kind of guide them, you know, trying to try to be the sort of conduit between the client, the producers, the creative, like, team, and just communicate between all these different really smart people. And so it's it becomes less obvious if you're not having your best day ever because there's so much support, you know. So... That's what's different to when you do it by yourself. If you have a bad day, like it's very obvious because your your cinematographer, sound recordist, producer, editor, everything yourself, you know. Yeah. So okay. I know you. I know you know about this. Well, life. look, I know, but uh, I didn't went that far. That probably we will speak a bit later because you you enter really in the big uh, movie industry, and I haven't been in this because I'm still working and com completely focused on do-it-yourself projects. I work for my for my own, so I didn't have mm. to print out emails and meet uh, uh, serious agencies, <laughs> distributors, uh, producers, and uh, etc. I do everything on my own, so I don't really know this. Why for me it's also interesting, as I imagine for many people who are listening that. Uh, how how it happens that one person taking the camera for the first time 10 years later creates uh, the movie uh, documentary it's, this is amazing for me and it's it's a good lesson and a good example for the people to see actually what is possible because do you do you think that is that mm. is possible other people to do it Does, is it extraordinary what happened to you how how would you consider this this success or this achievement if you mm. if you don't consider it as a success but it is an achievement how uh, do you think this is possible other people to do it yeah of course i've i've had to learn it's actually my mom like sent me this really angry email recently because she'd read some interview that I'd done where I kept saying that I was lucky or something and my mum was like stop saying that that you're just lucky because you there is a lot of hard work that's gone into this and I started to think back and I'm trying to practice a little bit more objectivity with when it comes to my career and I think yeah like I, you know yes I think I was super lucky and I was very much in the right place at the right time and time as in like I think it's important for people to to know that 10 years ago it wasn't as competitive um, as it is now to be a, a videographer, you know. It was quite a new thing and it happened quite quickly, YouTube and all these things. So as in a, like that kind of time scale, I think it was a good time to start. Um, but it was also a lot of work, you know, and I, I think back to my 20s and I remember nine nights out of 10, I'd get invited to a party and I wouldn't go. I never went out, what, what, you know. I just would many, sit in front of my of computer. Times or what is the? Yeah, okay. yeah. I would just. I was really antisocial. I'd just stay at home on my computer, mm -hmm. and um, and 
yeah, like I'd, I've so I, just lately I've started to be a bit more sympathetic to to that and and you know. But that being said, I think it's totally possible for anyone else to do this. You know, I think you've just got to find find your niche and find the thing that that you can do that no one else can do, or that um, find that opportunity in your set of circumstances. And you know, surely, I mean, you would agree. Yep. I feel like. I feel like you and I have that in common that we've, you know, maybe we've been lucky, but I think you also work super hard and, and the, the things that have happened in your career haven't happened because of luck, no, you know? I, it's, it's all been pretty... This is what I want to, to, to bring back the conversation is actually speaking about the luck because, yes, there is, a, there, there is luck. There is also opportunity for me, for me personally, you know, thinking and when I listen to you or if, if I, I analyze the work of somebody, for sure there is luck. There is, if you call it opportunity as well, there, there are opportunities happening, but for sure if you're not a hard worker, if you don't take this opportunity, this means you don't take the, the, take the, the step to work you don't, uh, you're not going to achieve anything. I mean, Iron Luck could provide you the opportunity to make a video, but you could also refuse it. You could do one shitty video that they don't like, and then then the whole life is go- not going to be the same. Imagine, you know, it's like a butterfly effect, mm. you know? Uh, but... Yeah, don't totally. you think that actually the the and you say you know the, the f- two things to say the first thing to say is that yes you had luck but I have seen you personally I have seen how you work and it's impressive you know I don't <laughs> I I appreciate oh. a lot people who work hard because I try to work hard all the time and uh, all the time you know it's uh, for me the same I uh, have skipped a lot of parties and I skip a lot of uh, social gatherings and things because I want to produce stuff. And when I see people in this mm. uh, mindset, some somebody like you, and yes, for sure, it's good to be humble. You're humble. This is nice. It's good to appreciate the, the opportunities of life. But I, I've i seen how you run here around in Athens and you didn't sleep and you didn't eat and you were 24 hours uh, <laughs> preparing the the drone and it's this this is something that you have to see to understand you know it's like uh, people would see one finished product they would see one video they would see one movie and they would say yeah okay it's nice nice time lapse she's a, she's a professional she knows how to deal with the camera she has ideas she has a vision uh, she technically or she knows the good people or she knows the artists but all of this wouldn't be possible on my opinion, if you don't put the work. Yeah, I'd say that's probably true. And, uh, Cause, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think, but but I also think that when you find the thing that you, that that's really your calling in life or that is that you're really good at, it becomes easier to, to work hard because it's, um, it's, uh, it sounds corny to say, oh, it doesn't feel like work, like for sure it's work, but, um, you know, it's better than anything else you could be doing for, for work, you know. Mm. I had one job, the last paying job I had, I was 18 years old and I worked in a call centre. And my job was to take, people would ring up and they had to place ads in the newspaper, like the classifieds at the back of the yep. newspaper. You know, so like people having a garage sale or, and it was, it sucked. It was such a horrible, horrible place to work and and it was so depressing just sitting inside all day under those horrible lights and everyone's mean to each other because they're all miserable as well. And I was like, I'm not, I'm not going to stay in a place like this. Like, I can't. I can't live like this. And, I, and it scared me back to university and it scared me, you know. And so I think, you know, yes, it's hard work to, to, to be like a freelancer, but it's for sure worth it because the alternative is, is not so nice either, you know. So, but, um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Okay, I had the, now I see some of the questions already raised because you already speak about it, but still I would like to come back to this is that the, I was about to ask you why did you decide to work with graffiti writers, but apparently what I understood is it was the opportunity and you know why I'm asking, just, just not to confuse you, I'm asking because I would like to hear if you found something in this movement, in this culture, or it's just what you have in front of you you have the access and the opportunity for it and oh. you and you are working no, for with this sh- for sure i think it's it's super interesting and i'm so grateful to be a part of it and um i i've definitely like d- branched out into other other interests but it's just always i mean 
it's just always interested me and fascinated me. And I think that nowhere else do you find people who are, um, who are like, I mean, there's the, the, oh gosh, I'm not going to make any sense, but it's hard to explain what, why I find it so fascinating. But I just think that there's definitely something about the DIY nature of it. And, and also like when we're talking about illegal graffiti, the, fa the idea that people would put so much time and energy and effort into something that's done anonymously and that's not really done for, for the public, especially in, in this era when everything is so public facing and image focused and there's, um, there's just so much, um, so many layers of, of, it's like a real culture, you know, there's language, there's rules of, you know, behavior and there's like ways people dress and people's lifestyles and, um, you know, their stories and there's, there's a kind of crazy diversity of, of people's backgrounds, but then there's also a lot of similarities in all the stories you hear from graffiti writers. And I just think it's fascinating. You know, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And, um, I don't know many other people who have had the opportunity that I've had where thanks to the network that we've all built, um, you know, people that participate in this culture that I can go to pretty much any country in the world, maybe not any country, but mo anywhere in Europe and someone will, in some city will, will welcome me and will, you know, at the very least, maybe we'll go and have a beer or we'll, we'll go and have dinner at the, at most, like I've had people offer me a place to stay and that's amazing to me, you know, and that, that, that really keeps yeah. me motivated and um, I think it's beautiful and um, yeah, and also it's just, it's a great thing to document because it's, it's dynamic, it's moving, it's ephemeral, um, you know, especially, and I, I kind of, sorry, I'm jumping all over the place, but I... No, no worry. Perfect. You're going great. I only really kind of rediscovered like illegal graffiti um, a couple of years ago, and 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 mm -hmm. when I when I did sort of rediscover it, like I, I really fell in love with it, you know, in a big way because there's not many other things that you can document nowadays where you're the only one that's got those pictures, you know, and if it wasn't for you yeah. being there, then those it's exclusive. Yeah, I love that. I love that, and I love I love the idea that. Um, you're like creating a moment in time, like you're, you're creating something like an, a, an artifact that would otherwise not exist, you know? It just feels really vital and yes. um, not many people can say that. I guess I try and compare it to some extreme sports, you know, like I'm sure that there's a community in those kinds of worlds that um, everyone knows each other and they go on these crazy adventures and so on. But um, yeah, I just don't think there's anything else really like it. Um, that that I've found, so that's why I keep doing it. Yeah. Okay, and uh, because many people ask, you know, in the in the comments, and uh, I think everybody, you know, there there are the two questions that or excuses that people would say, and what the the first one is like, how do you get in touch with person mm. X? You know, you you have worked with uh, best of the best. It's not even necessary to name drop. Uh, names it's uh, coming from graffiti to street art you have worked with the uh, with amazing big uh, big artists successful artists very talented people and uh, people of course are asking themselves how and why it's uh, why she wh how how it, it happens and let's say you have the opportunity but what, what what do you think why do you think you have the opportunity and the access to do you realize do you have you analyzed and how do you do you, do you understand how it happens and and why um i think i think that it's definitely a there's definitely a lot of like um sort of word of mouth the reference like you know once you've worked with one person and you've done a good job and you've been respectful and you've and you've fulfilled all of your promises to them and you've made a good product everybody like other people see that and that person will tell you know others and and it is like a network and everyone does know each other and reputation is important um reputation. yeah i but yeah I, I think i and i also just reach out to people you know and that's i think 
the an important thing is you know people can't say yes if you don't ask and I think I actually remember reaching I, I wrote I wrote one of my like classic emails to you the first time I came to Paris you know because I was like I'm going to Paris who can I hang out with in Paris or who 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 would I like to work with in Paris and I wrote to you and I was like Dear, dear Mr. Good Guy Boris, my name is Lena Miles and I'm from Australia. Uh, here's one of my videos. I was, <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah, I, I, I don't remember. I now that you say that, I will have to search in my for email sure, to see this email. For sure, email. you still have it. It's, <laughs> but I, I don't, I don't even remember how how I wrote we you. first uh, get approach. Was it do, via Felipe no. or I'm not sure? I, but, I wrote you an uh, email. I was I was in yes, London. Amazing. I was coming to Paris, and I and I wrote to you, and I was like, "Hello, um, I I'm also like a filmmaker, and I really like your work, and I was wondering if you'd like to like meet up and get a coffee or something, you know?" And and yeah, that's totally how it's done. <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah, what I that's cute. what I do. It's so so nice. But anyway, look, the, sooner or later we we would link, you know. It's yeah. The, if uh, if you were, uh, I mean. I haven't met everybody, and you haven't met everybody, I suppose, in the in the scene. But the scene is not that big, and the people who actually are doing things and make things happen are not that mm-hmm. much. So, if you want to to extend your network sooner or later, you meet people, and it's nice. Actually, it's uh, it's pretty cool that we had the, I had the opportunity to meet <laughs> you. This is great. But yeah, I think having uh, I think having a portfolio is just the most important thing. Like have a have a good portfolio of of yes. the type of work that you are approaching someone about and say, hey, this is who I am, this is what I want, this is what I can offer, here's some examples. So, like, it seems obvious, but it's amazing how often people write to me these days, like, and they just, they, it's like no effort goes into their email, you know, and they're asking me for something, and it's like, yeah. I just don't understand. Like, if you can't make the effort to write, to spend five more minutes writing, like, a proper email that explains everything I need to know... Why would I make the effort to Tell respond? Tell me what is a proper know? email, Selena. Oh, what just is, like s- how how would you like people to 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 contact you to say, "Hi, I'm Boris. Uh, would you come to make a little documentary about <laughs> me? How should I contact you?" I'm sure. No, seriously, because people, I really, I want to hear it from you because I, you have these emails, mm-hmm. I have these emails, and I every day I open a DM or a message, and I cannot believe people really uh, doesn't have the fucking first seven years of their life to say to say hello and to ask what they want in a polite and proper yeah. way. So what would be the proper way for I you? I think when it comes to approaching like a potential collaborator, someone that you're trying to work with, I think it's always good to use language of like offering something rather than asking for something. Um, so, mm-hmm. you know, rather than saying, I'm at university and I need to do an assignment for my last semester and my teacher said that it has to be about this and so I decided that it's going to, I want to make make it about you, so can you please answer these questions for me? Um, You could, you know, this exact same scenario, you could say, um, I really, I really like your work and so um, I was wondering if it's okay with you if I make a, uh, if I write an article about, you know, like and just make it more of an offering of of something and I think it's also just like, who, who are you? What's your story? Where are you from? Like, and just like be clear about, about, you know, what you're, what you need because, um, time, people's time is like a very valuable asset. So it's nice to be considerate of that. And, um, so when I, whenever I contact someone, I always try and be very clear about what I want so that they only need to write back once with a yes or no, rather than writing back 10 times asking for details, you know? Um, yeah. So that's, that's what I would say. I like the, the the point that you made with uh, giving value than uh, taking value, like mm. making an offer and then take, asking for something is better. And it's a valuable lesson that people should remember because nobody wants to open his email or his DMs and to have the, 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 the next message asking for something. Like nobody, I own nobody to nothing. You know, you, you own nothing to nobody. I mean, and... Uh, the way you can get anything is actually the vice versa. You you have to offer. You cannot take the time of somebody of some stranger and expect him just to to answer you or to 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 spend the time or spend the energy to give you anything without offering something. So I think it's a good approach. Yeah, yeah. 
let's uh, let's move forward we are uh, it's getting more and more interesting uh, I would like to speak for about something because I have read it also in in uh, some of your interview we, we had in the pre-conversation this this topic about being a female in the industry mm-hmm. being a female in the graffiti in the graffiti game even though that you don't write but you have you know some graffiti girls graffiti uh, female writers and you are a, you are a female yourself <laughs> apparently <laughs> Uh, <laughs> if, some, if some people didn't know let me tell you something my friends <laughs> uh, okay I have to be careful because my girlfriend will enter with the machete from the other room I broke the microphone here <laughs> wait a second let's, let's be professional yeah uh, okay uh, so what is the wait let me read the question Did being a female make a difference in your in your work? Yeah, that's a that's a good one. And how? I think for sure. I mean, I think that gender is still a huge thing. Um, I think that we all live with the pros and cons of our gender. Um, I think there's 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 difficult things about being either, but I think that you know, for me. I think I might have skipped a lot of the kind of machismo, aggress- aggression, kind of like mistrust that 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 comes with when two guys meet each other for the first time. Um, mm-hmm. I think people are a lot more polite to me quite often than they would be if I was male. They 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 and it's not out of I think the I think it's out of um just surprise to see a female, you know, in a lot of scenarios. Um but then I I don't know, I think most people that I've met in graffiti are just like quite courteous and like cool people to everyone, you know? So I think it's just about mutual respect and it's about the energy that you give off and um obviously there's always like a few weirdos around, but um Yes. People <laughs> people with no social skills that are, like don't know how to talk to girls but um um yeah and um I also think that it's it's a different case for me than it is for female writers and I do think that female writers have it a little bit tougher than I do um and mm-hmm. I Wow. Well, I mean, imagine that you're with a group and you're going out to paint like a, okay, we're going to paint a whole car. Um, it's mm-hmm. like, you know, oh, yeah, let's take Selena so she can get good photos. Cool. But if you've got a group of people and you're choosing who gets to go, for sure the, the, the girl who's probably short and or shorter than everyone else or whatever, it always ends up being the one that goes to check, you know, like it's just like it's, it becomes, no, it's true though. I've seen it happen a hundred times and it's really, it's, it's sad. Don't stop laughing. No, but there's like... It's, I'm when laughing, the, when you, it's not true. <laughs> you're laughing because it's true. I'm, oh, I'm embarrassed now. I hope no girls are watching this being like, you bitch. But no, like, I'm just saying that like, when it comes to like, comp- when you are getting compared to a guy, like in f- the sense of like physicality and what you're capable of, a lot of the time women get left behind and it's unfair because a lot of the girls I know are just as good as the guys, but they just get pushed to the side. Um And that doesn't happen to me as much because right. it's not like there's a thousand photographers around waiting to... Um, fuck, I hope that's not bad to say. Yeah. So I, I, I guess I just want to say that um, I don't want to sit here and be like, oh, it's not difficult to be a woman because I know that there are women that have it really tough. Um, but, yeah, it's it's um, it's definitely not a, a misogynist culture. I don't think that it is. Um, and... Overall, people have been very kind to me. So, and I'm, I've, I've made a lot of good friends, male and female. So, yeah, I think at the end of the day, like, as long as you're good at what you do, people kind of are willing to overlook everything else, you know. So. Yeah, gender, race, and uh, you yeah. mean this, uh, this type of uh, term. And if you're short, because me, I'm short, and people don't really, when they go to 10 people in the whole car, and they say, Boris, <laughs> you short. <laughs> No, because it's like <laughs> be me short but faster. Yeah, but like I never, I never, I only just figured this out recently that like 
if you're like short, your piece is going to be like that much smaller than if you're tall. You know, it sounds seems obvious, but like it doesn't matter when. It, Not if you have a friend that you go on his shoulders and then every time you make uh, you make like this and people think you are very very sh- very tall. <laughs> I didn't think about this one coming. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. That's a silly theory that I have, but um. Yeah, but okay. Do oh for for this subject also also like being a female. So you you what you said is like you didn't feel any kind of. Um, discrimination or something like this being a female I mean it, in the, also as well not only in the graffiti but also in the industry of oh uh, the film industry uh, is very making. different so the f- yeah yeah tell me about it I've had just just on this subject we will move to the film industry after I just want to hear about this subject like being a yeah, woman yeah, yeah. there what what is oh, do you have a smaller paycheck oh or what? yeah for sure like it's like docu- well documented that women get paid less for the exact same work I've had um You know, I've been walking into a trailer on my set in Los Angeles, working on a commercial, and there's someone in the trailer, and um, they say, who are you? What are you doing here? Are you, like, the makeup artist or something? And I'm like, no, bro, I'm the director. <laughs> This is my fucking shoot. <laughs> You're on my set. Like, who are you? You know? And, and they're always, like, horrified and look so embarrassed, you know? But people just would never imagine that, A, it would be a woman, and B, they would be so young. And that's happened to me like so many times and okay. often it's really hard to get people to listen to you and um, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it, but it's most of the time it's just funny because I feel like the, the main crew that, that you work with, like directly with are always really cool. It's just like they're, they're, they're like their crew, you know, and that, that might not interact with you directly and they don't know who the director is. And when they see you, they're just, they're just, look at you like, why are you here? Why, why aren't you like an old white dude? Um, so, okay, yeah, yeah but it's getting better. I think it's slowly improving over time. Yeah. Yeah, this is, I think in, in, in everything, it's, uh, we're having an improvement, you know, yeah. it's, it's just still... I hear stories of still what it was exists. like in the 70s. I, me, what I have seen, I have seen... Me, I have been discriminated as a guy. Oh, really? Because when there is a girl in the gang, there is all the attention and all the good treatment. <laughs> you actually see your friends and strangers, how well they treat a yeah. lady, you know? It's like, they will help. Nobody ever helped me to <laughs> jump a fence. Nobody ever say, hey, would you like me to help you to, f- to feelings? Hey, can I, uh, can I carry your accounts and things know, like right? this? Hey, nobody. For sure, people have been nice to me. They gave me beers. They make a compliment. But I have seen the better... And I understand. I am a victim <laughs> of I don't know what is even the name, but I have been a victim. This is not this I is know <laughs> people help me over fences all the It time because I don't have the upper body strength to get over them by myself. <laughs> It's always embarrassing yeah, though. Yeah, true, but okay, <laughs> after, of course, uh, when you have uh, somebody, it's like, okay, can I please help you? No, no, it's okay. No, no, let, let me please help you. Let, I, no, no, I insist. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, let's jump into talking about film. Okay. I have put in the in my, in my category film starting to... starting with the Wanderers, mm-hmm. with the Project Wanderers. Would you tell shortly, briefly, what was, what is this project? Yeah, so that was um, something that came about from a producer in Australia who um, saw, we were, sorry, I'll start again. We are really lucky in Australia because we have a lot of um, grants from the government for our film industry. Yeah, very different to the US. Whenever I tell my American friends, oh, the government funded this project, they're like, what, what? But um, if they didn't do it here, we wouldn't have a film industry, so that's why they do it. And um, there was a grant offered by ABC, which is like the national broadcaster here in Australia, to make a six-part series, art series, aimed at like a young audience. And this producer thought street art would be like a good topic, and so he approached me um, to put together a pitch, and we we won, so we got some, some money to make that. And we spent all the money and then probably half of that money again <laughs> because we, we went so over the top with our concept. Um, but we got eight, uh, sorry, six different Australian artists and we took them to six different locations in Australia and surrounds to 
have their work influenced by the place and, and make a, a film about, or a series of films about how, um, it was like a travel street art show, basically. So, um, yeah, mm-hmm. that's, that was it. And it was, it was, it was a lot of work, but it, it was great. It was a really fun experience. And we had a crew of four people and we went all over the country to some places that most people never get to see, like the Tiwi Islands, which is an Aboriginal community in the north of, um, in the Northern Territory. It's like completely different worlds, you know? And we went to Vanuatu, we went to Tasmania. So um, combining my two favorite things, like shooting, you know, street art and traveling and just getting paid to do it. So that was, it was pretty awesome. Yeah, yeah. And it was cool because I got to work with like broadcasters, um, you know, like national broadcasters and people that um, produce television day in, day out. So um, that really sort of forced me to be a, a bit better and a bit take it a bit more seriously because you're telling a story for the public, mm-hmm. not a story for um, like a graffiti fan base type of audience. For the graffiti yeah. public, yeah. yeah. For general, we were working for a general audience and you were working also with a with a general audience customer or provider who has, I believe, some requirements different than the requirements that you have, for example, by Iron Lack yeah. or, or just by yourself. Yeah. So you have to follow... Do you have to follow some different standards yeah. in these productions? This is actually... Because for me, maybe it's clear, but for somebody else, it's not clear. So what is the difference working... What is the difference of doing a do-it-yourself project, let's say... Uh, any of your do-it-yourself projects compared to Marta mm-hmm. movie or compared to Wanderers or any other commercial projects that you have people responsible yeah. and some way above you. So what what is the difference? Um, I think they're just a lot more structured. A, because there's an investment involved. So um, when you've got a client who's given you money to make something, you need to be able to promise them a certain product and deliver on that. And that's a different experience to just doing it yourself um, and making something for the public this was definitely most um, most obvious on on Martha was there's so much assumed knowledge that that we have um, you know if, if you're making a video for the grifters you're assuming that people know what graffiti is they know all the language they know why those people are doing it, they know who they are. Yeah. When, you're, when you're making a film, you have to start at the beginning, you know, and explain every little step to, to lay down that foundation of context for the story. Because if, if for a second your audience feels like they don't understand what they're looking at, you've lost them and they won't enjoy the film, you know? And it's, it's so tedious, you know, having to explain. Um, and you, you might, I mean, you've seen the film now, like there's a section... Um, where we sort of meet all the early graffiti writers like Scheme and um, we meet Henry Chalfont and um, who else is in there? Lee Quinones and the stuff that they're explaining is so basic, you know, and it, it, that, that was one of the hardest parts of the film to edit because we really had to be like, which is the essential information here? You know, in something as complicated as graffiti culture or the birth of graffiti culture in New York City, like... Like, and you have to just strip it back to like every word and every shot has to be essential to the story, but also if it wasn't there, it wouldn't make sense. And it's, it's like a really hard pr- uh, process, especially if you're really close to something and you, you can't actually see your own, um, not your own sort of understanding and experience of, of something and how it might not make sense to someone who doesn't have your experience. Um, so that's why it's always good to have other people around you to, to, to bounce things off. Otherwise you just have no clue. So, um, yeah, yeah. That's the hardest part. Like speaking to a specific, um, audience rather than just making it for you and your friends kind of thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, just to, before we start speaking about Mark, just to finish about the Wanderers, where the people can, can see the, the project. You know what? To read about it, to yeah, watch it. Yeah, it's on it's on Vimeo on demand um, right now. It's like five dollars to buy the whole series, but I think I'm gonna just make it free um, now that we're in quarantine because we just got our like our contract with the ABC just ended, so now 
we own it, so I might just remember to make it open so everyone can see it. Um, because yeah, so okay. it'll just be on Vimeo. But the, today, right now, they can they can see it video on demand. Yeah. This means like Six they bucks. pay a little money and they can mm -hmm. rent it or own it, like uh, own own the digital file or download it and watch it yeah. whenever they want. Okay, so let's jump into Martha movie. Yesterday you gave me the great opportunity to see it. Amazing movie, great job. Thank you for watching uh, it. You just outdid yourself for another time. And uh, for me, it was a really big pleasure to see it because I only see things online. I heard the reviews, I heard people talking about it, but I never saw it. So yesterday I saw it and I said, okay, wow. And uh, let's break it down. Uh, why Marta? Whoa. Well, she was meant to be the third in this portrait of an artist series. So the first one was Guido van Helten in Iceland. With the, with the whale boat captain. Then it was Felipe Pantone, he was the second. And that was going to be an ongoing series of 10 minute portraits of different artists um, with the goal being to make everyone really different stylistically um, and have the, the style and personality of the subject influence the style of the filmmaking. And so she was my third and, um, and I've, I emailed her, I asked, I asked her when we were in Tahiti on a, on a project together and she said, yes, um, I could come to New York and make a 10-minute piece about her, you know, so I was like, oh, it's just going to be two weeks and I'll just come to New York for two weeks and we'll make something. And um, the first day that I, la I, I think it was the first day I landed, I interviewed Susan Welchman, who was her boss at the New York Post and at National Geographic. And this woman was just so amazing. And Martha also gave me the keys to her studio. And she's like, you can sleep in here. And, oh, you know, it's just like, it's like a treasure trove of, of memorabilia, graffiti memorabilia. And there's like drawers and drawers of slides of, you know, original everything. It's just absolutely amazing. And um, as soon as I got in there, like, I think the first day I was like, I don't know how I'm going to fit this into 10 minutes. This is... <laughs> you know, this is just so cool. You realize this. Uh, you realize this. This is not gonna fit, uh, and you also probably see an opportunity for a for a film. No, right? not at all. I didn't. I never thought that I could make a film. I, I imagined that films were this kind of unachievable, unattainable, other level, unreachable. You know, that like the like the big. You know, the movie industry was was somehow out of my reach, and. Um, But I just kept filming and filming and I remember just being like, oh my God, what am I going to do with all this footage? Why do I keep filming this more and more? Just keeps, you know, I was there for two weeks and we just filmed every day. And um, we went to the Women's March on Washington the day before tr Trump's inauguration, you know, it was a crazy time to, to be there as well. It was February, it was super freezing cold and... Um, And then I just kind of sat on that footage for a few months and I didn't really even know where to start. I just kept following Martha around <laughs> and filming her. I went to Burn Makes Sense. So, um, yeah, it's a totally different process. Totally different. Tell me, just we will finish uh, now, just to, to, to tell me... Uh, The, what did you discover in the film industry? What was, what was interesting and what was different than your previous work? Because, okay, you, it's, I think for many people it would be interesting who probably would be able or already doing and doing videos at home or streaming from home or creating content or anything. But the moment when you really enter on a movie set or you start to work with producers mm. and have to be you have certain responsibilities yeah. and it's not small responsibilities when you have a budget when you have a, when you're doing this all legal and would you would you explain a bit to somebody mm. who really doesn't probably doesn't even have can imagine or maybe a somebody who is a movie maker who have idea how to do movies but what is the difference than doing a movie for yourself or for a small customer but then doing a movie for cinema um 
I think that the 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 steepest learning curve for me was um, learning how to work on paper, and I had all my mentors, to, you know, because I was assigned mentors like other filmmakers that had been through this process and um, were a few years or a few films more experienced, and they say learn how to work on paper, and you know, coming from the DIY world where you just you don't really have a script. You don't really have an idea of what you want to do. You just go out, shoot a whole bunch of shit, bring it home, sit there in your underpants, drink red wine and figure it out. And it turns into something and you're like, I guess this is it. And you just throw it on, online, you know, and it's, that's the process. And that's how I'd always worked. And then all of a sudden you can't work like that because you have a crew and you have, you know, people that need to see what you're doing and how it's all working. So, um, learning how to write treatments, learning how to write scripts, learning how to do paper edits, which was such a difficult transition for me, but it's actually so much quicker and so much better and I really recommend it. Um, so, yeah, just going from being... Oh, I'm still here. Hear Hello. Okay, we're back. Woohoo! Hello. I don't know what happened. Sorry about that. Where we were, Yay. yeah. That's yeah. okay. Totally us. Um, yes. I was the, rambling. Like the whole interview. <laughs> Talking a whole bunch of shit. Okay. Um. <laughs> Do you, what, tell me, have you thought about working on another uh, featured film graffiti related? Oh, yes, so many times. I really, I really, really would love to make a documentary mm -hmm. about illegal, like modern European graffiti so badly. But I just cannot, I haven't figured out a way yet to, to deal with the, the challenge of not... Uh. Yeah, I was just saying that um, I... I just cannot figure out a way around the challenge that, you know, anyone who's serious about graffiti doesn't want their face or their voice or their, you know, their home or where they work or who their mum and dad are, like any of this stuff to be yeah. broadcasted to the world. And this is what makes somebody human and what makes them an interesting, relatable, engaging character. So if you take away all of that stuff... You've just got a bunch of, you know, robot blurred face robot people and you can't connect with them as characters and so it's not going to sustain a, a feature look, film, you you're know. You're looking for a way around. So, yeah, I've thought about some different ways and I can't, I can't think of any that could work. I think it's just, I mean, and also the investment of, of time that, it, that you'd, you'd have to sort of dive into, you'd want to know that it was going to work. I think the best way to do it would be to shoot something now with the plan to release it in 10 years, you know, or 15 years or, and just accept that there's, yeah, yeah there's, this for me has, is not the solution. Well, then what's the solution? There isn't one really, you know, unless like the, the only other way I thought that you could do it is you could, and I, like, I hope no one listens to this and, and does it better than I could have. I'll be so pissed, but, um, you know, if you could, if you could um, have everything but but the graffiti, you know, like yes. I think this is probably would be the most interesting way to do it. But it's still a, it's too much to ask people to um, expose themselves like that. So it'd take it'd take a lot of um, energy. And then also like, what's the narrative? You know, a bunch of yeah bunch of different people stories you know yeah but like what what's the conclusion what's the what's the proposition it's it's a it's a tricky one you know but if somebody does it well like it'll be amazing um i think you know like dirty hands or something like that is probably the best the best one i've seen what's your favorite graffiti like film or graffiti video dirty hands three yeah yeah, yeah. they just yeah it's so beautiful it's like yeah, I don't think there's any topping that, so, yeah. 
I, the, the thing is, there is a movie now. Uh, there is a German guy who made a documentary about three people traveling, and he's documenting only their faces and not the pieces. So this is mm-hmm. a clever way to mm. to go around. This is one of the ideas that probably many people or some people thought about. And this is the one workaround. Another workaround is to work with people who are uh, suicidal, people who don't care, and they are putting their faces and still doing illegal graffiti. But there are so many uh, obstacles on the way to do it because even if somebody is accepting, on my opinion, if somebody even is accepting to put his face on and to put himself in the trouble, I don't want to be the person who put him into trouble because apparently maybe he don't have enough responsibility or understanding what the troubles that he can face. But if you know and you're doing it intentionally to create a movie, it's... I don't see it morally morally correct, even though if it's like mm. uh, if it's like a documentary. But okay, this is my sentimental part. But, yeah. Um, well, I mean, we had I this with Marco. Look, we had lawyers and we had legal opinions in three different countries um, to understand wh- how, like, what risks we were putting Martha under, you know. Yeah. And. Um, it was actually surprisingly positive. Like um, Germany, Australia, and the U.S. Our lawyers said um, that when it comes to me having documented something that might have involved like a crime, like trespassing, or Martha having done so, um, there's really, really strong protections in place for journalists in all three of those countries, and for a journalist, which we would both be classified as to be subpoenaed to give information about their subjects would be unprecedented. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, we just, we just budgeted, we had a, like a, a a kind of a a segment of the budget put aside in case something happened, um, legally, but nothing, nothing so far. (laughs) So, um, Yeah. yeah. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of, it's just a, it would be a huge undertaking to make a, a, a documentary about something like that, but you know, people people do it. Like I, one of the one of my mentors was Erin Casper. She's the editor of some of um, Laura Poitras's films. Laura Poitras made Risk, which is the documentary about Julian Assange, and um, yeah. uh, Citizen Four. I think it's you know, Citizen uh, the one about Edward Snowden, who was like the whistleblower. Okay. You know, and this yep. woman is like flying back and forth from like Asia and Europe to America with footage of a known like treason, you know, like whistleblower yeah. against the US mm-hmm. and having mm-hmm. to like work with this footage and edit it and stuff. And um, so, yeah, listening to their stories, I was like, this is nothing compared to that. You know, it could be way worse. Yeah, true, so, true that. Yeah. But yeah, it's interesting. I hope somebody does it. I hope someone does a, a featured doc. I'd love to see it. So. It's time to yeah we it's out of time also we can we are a bit exhausted this is the first talk and it's uh, not good to torture your guests so I will finish with the uh, only three questions that I put out from the Instagram because we f- I failed the live stream apparently I just opened earlier and I saw uh, nobody hear you I don't know why but I am not gonna investigate and be out of the conversation right now but as I told you I want to focus on the recording so we will have the podcast and uh, live stream is something that uh, I have to work on but anyway let me read you the first question that is from beyond time Uh, whether graffiti Okay, future Sorry. plans. What? How do you see? Your face. <laughs> <laughs> what on my face? What about my face? It's how my mother made me. Or what? Uh, beyond time from Belgrade, Serbia is asking: hey. What are your future plans, and how do you see the future of uh, graffiti filmmaking? Ooh, um, I my future plans um, have all been put on hold because of the situation that we're in. I'm just my plans yeah. right now are to stay here and make some ads and um, you know save up some money so that when things return to normal, I can get out and do something fun with my savings. Um, yeah. As far as what's going to happen with the future of graffiti documentation, I think that there's some really amazing young 
documentarians out there doing amazing things um, and really getting a, a hang of some technology that I just don't even understand how it works. I think a good example of this is um, Captain Olf. Captain mm-hmm. Olf and, yeah. and his crew um, in Berlin with, the, with yeah. the first person view drone. That shit just blows my mind every time. Like, it's I'm, crazy. It's amazing. And, yeah. um, you know, uh, yeah, just better technologies. Technology becomes cheaper and more accessible. I think there's a lot of more people self-publishing or self-documenting, which is exciting. And, um, yeah, I don't know. I think it'll just expand in every direction and every which way, like... You know, um, okay. I just hope that that the gra- the gra- sort of graffiti culture in general stays strong because I think it's up against new challenges when it comes to like surveillance and security and those types of things as technology becomes more advanced. But um, I think people always find their ways and it comes and goes in different places and as a reaction to what's going on, kind of culturally or you know politically in different places and. Yeah, who knows where it's going to go next. It's exciting to see where it goes, I think. So. Yeah. Yeah, people were asking where, because we didn't also answer this, where they can see the... Oh, Martha. Because yeah. actually, yeah, Martha movie. When people can expect it, do you, can, you, can you promise anything? Can you tell something yeah. in concrete? Or? It's so tricky to, um, to know this stuff because you've got different territories and um, we've just been doing the film festival circuit. So um, it's been at a lot of different festivals. It's still going to some festivals, but it will be out soon. (laughs) That's all I can say. Okay. Um, Yeah. Just keep an eye on the Instagram page. It's probably the best place. As soon as we know something, we'll put it up there. Okay. Last question. Do you still watch? It's from uh, Said Kinos, and oh. he's asking if you're still watching plane crash videos before you catch your flights. Um, no, because they haven't made any new seasons of Air Crash Investigation. It's my favorite show, oh. and I, I've seen. Okay. <laughs> I've seen like. But you watch this before you catch your plane. No, I just used to watch it all the time, like all the time, like oh, every yes. night before I went to bed. There was something about the like voiceover was really soothing. <laughs> and also I kind of learned all the things that can go wrong. So w- as you're taking off, you're like, all right, cool. So how many rows to the exit? And like, you know, all these tricks, you know, and then you're like, all right, once we make it to 20,000 feet, the only thing that can really go wrong is an explosive decompression. And even if that happens, like, you know, it's, yeah, it's just rationalizing okay. a, a bit of a fear. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's a great show. You should check it out. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else would you like to would you like to say? Um, Any final words? I would just like to say thank you so much for having me on your show. I feel so I feel so honored to be your first guest on like your on the new the new re, reinvented um, podcast. It's so cool. Um, yeah, because I've been a big fan of you for for a really long time as well, and I remember watching your videos long before we met and and admiring them and copying things from them and thinking that it was just the coolest so it's really nice that um that you had me on and that you're interested in listening to me talk so much shit (laughs) pleasure is all mine (laughs) thank you thank you uh should we drop out some links or something no i don't think so Uh, i don't have anything to plug yeah you've got some stuff to (laughs) plug I have nothing to plug. The, the thing is, I'm a bit embarrassed right now because the live stream failed and uh, I don't even know what is happening. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, coming or how you say it. Thank you for being part of, for agreeing. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the nice conversation. It was great. I hope people would listen and those who listen understood because you said uh, important stuff and interesting stuff. And... Uh, That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to all the listeners. Much love. Kisses. I can't believe I just and did a I'm double just ending... Why did I do that? Huh? I just We did say... this. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> It's not Who this in that? Australia. It's no. It's not this in Australia. I don't know why I did that. I've never done that before in my life. Surfer dude or something. Maybe I'm getting a bit drunk. Here we go. Cheers. We can say a little cheers. Horace I'm Bajowski. totally not sponsored. Yeah. Cheers. A little miles. Boom. Kisses. Pleasure as always. Okay. Uh, We say goodbye, but we will not say goodbye. We just cut the life and then we can say goodbye normally.
Okay. Bye everybody. <laughs> bye, uh, bye regular people, not Selena Miles. <laughs>